butters of our commonwealth, Pennsylvania, blessed with more rivers and streams than any other state in our nation. The waters of our commonwealth begin as rain, clean, life-giving rain, a bountiful measure of pure, fresh water for every acre in the commonwealth. Slowly, drop by drop, this water starts its journey to the sea, grows into sparkling mountain streams, glides through the lush green meadows, turns into broad, beautiful rivers, and finally provides a deep water route to the ports of the world, a great natural resource, essential to the continued growth and prosperity of Pennsylvania. Not all of the rain flows into our rivers and streams. Much of it forms an underground water reserve, which we can see bubbling forth at springs, or pump up from the ground a little at a time, or more often by the tank full for use by our towns and industries. These water resources are an essential part of an industrial pattern so rich and varied that Pennsylvania leads the nation in output of basic commodities. Up to 65,000 gallons of water are used in making a ton of steel. Water is a raw material for synthetic fibers, and it's used in washing, bleaching, and dyeing textiles. Millions of tons of water to clean and process foodstuffs. And among others, our pulp and paper industry could not exist without the bountiful water resources of the Commonwealth. Water is a vital resource to our vast agricultural industry. Our farms, dairies, and orchards require a constant, unfailing supply. The tourist industry, providing our seventh largest source of income, depends on water resources too. Tourists from all over the country come to enjoy Pennsylvania's scenic beauty, to relax, to get away from daily problems, and to return to the job again with happy memories of Pennsylvania's vacation land. But most of us don't think of water as a great natural resource. It's just something wet, something hot or cold that comes from the tap when we need it. And we need more of it than you think. Fifty years ago, public water supply was a relatively simple problem. Today, there are more people and more industries using more water, ten times as much as we used 50 years ago. To the men responsible for your public water supply, this means solving one problem after another. We need a public water supply to protect our property, and sometimes our lives. In public buildings, offices, stores, hospitals, there is an insistent demand for clean water in ever-increasing quantities. And we use water in hundreds of ways just to keep things clean. Finally, serving us in still another way, the waters of the Commonwealth provide a means for disposing of the wastes from factory, farm, and community. Back in the year 1900, waste disposal was just starting to become a serious source of pollution for our waters. But it seems to have always been a part of man's instinct to dispose of wastes by dumping them into the streams, where the flowing waters soon carried them away. With each increase in population, our streams were burdened with increasing amounts of waste. Indiscriminate dumping of untreated refuse and sewage was never good practice, but in the old days, most streams were able to handle the relatively small amounts of waste they received. But Pennsylvania's come a long way since the horse and buggy days, thanks to the advantages which have made her history one of progress and prosperity. Fine, rich farmlands, and a temperate climate, a wealth of anthracite and bituminous coal. Oil was a Pennsylvania discovery and the source of much of our wealth. Great railroad systems throughout the state, an abundance of clean, pure water, and the skill and the ability of Pennsylvania's sons and daughters. All these factors contributed to the tremendous growth in population since 1900 assured Pennsylvania's continued leadership in heavy industry and greatly increased the size of our towns and metropolitan areas. 
keeping pace with the growing population and industrial expansion was the thoughtless but systematic pollution of our great God-given natural resource, the waters of our commonwealth. Yes, this is polluted water, polluted from many sources, a natural resource with its value greatly impaired and almost destroyed. Pollution comes from the rotting and decaying matter floating on or suspended in the waters. From liquid wastes discharged by factories and mills. From a careless use of insecticides and other poisons. From the acid drainage of active or worked out mines. From the black silt washed away when coal is cleaned before shipping. From the erosion of tons of precious soil carried away to become useless polluting silt and from the discharge of vast quantities of raw, untreated sewage from our cities and towns. Because of pollution from all these sources, many of the waters of our commonwealth became dirty, filthy, dangerous, teeming with disease germs. This is pollution. These are the polluted waters of the commonwealth. Polluted water is a threat to each one of us. Here is a drop of water polluted by untreated sewage seen through a microscope. This is pollution close at hand, teeming with the germs of epidemic diseases. Before it reaches the tap, your public water supply is treated to kill disease germs. But sometimes there are bad smells and tastes that can't be eliminated. As citizens, we should be aware of the cost of pollution in terms of recreation denied to us and our families with a corresponding loss in tourist trade. Our industries pay a high price for water pollution, which can cause severe corrosion like this. Clean water for manufacturing purposes often must be pumped from our decreasing underground reserves. Cleaning and purifying this polluted water requires the installation and use of expensive water treatment plants. Here at our state capital, Pennsylvania's fight to check water pollution started in 1905 with a law requiring the treatment of sewage. The problem grew more serious, so in 1923, a special organization, the Sanitary Water Board, was established within the Department of Health. In 1937, the board was granted additional legal power to preserve and improve the purity of the waters of the Commonwealth. In spite of greatly increased anti-pollution measures, pollution gained headway as more people and more industries were attracted to our state. In 1945, this act brought the remaining sources of pollution under legal control, and the current intensive anti-pollution campaign was started on its way. The campaign immediately won the enthusiastic support of Governor Duff, who was then Pennsylvania's Attorney General. Under Governor Duff's inspiring leadership, the drive to clean up the waters of our Commonwealth has drawn the attention of the entire nation. The technical and field work of the Sanitary Water Board is carried out by the Department of Health's Bureau of Sanitary Engineering, working through its central staff at Harrisburg and district offices throughout the state. Fish killings, which indicate acute pollution, are investigated by wardens of the Pennsylvania Fish Commission. Department of Health engineers determine and trace the source of pollution. The Sanitary Water Board acts upon all matters relating to water pollution. Its major responsibility is controlling the treatment of waste so that it will be harmless enough to discharge into the stream. To fulfill this responsibility, the board orders the installation of treatment plants, specifies that treatment plants be included in new construction, and inspects plants already in operation. Scientific research, financed and supervised in part by the board, 
is seeking new ways to keep harmful wastes of all kinds from polluting our streams. Plans for both municipal and industrial treatment plants are checked and must be approved by the board before construction begins. Part of the expense of preparing plans for municipal sewage treatment installations is borne by the state. From these blueprints will come efficient modern plants to effectively treat the sewage of communities ranging in size from small villages to large cities. Let's see just how the treatment process keeps sewage from polluting our waters. When the flow of sewage first enters the plant, it is screened to remove coarse materials and rags, and then passed through the grit chamber to remove fine grit and sand. In the primary settling tank, practically all of the settleable solids suspended in sewage drop to the bottom in the form of sludge. The grease skimmer removes oil, fat, and grease from the surface of the flow. The sludge from settling tanks goes to the sludge digester. Here it is attacked by a group of helpful bacteria which thrive under warm conditions and in the absence of air. They convert the sludge into gas and an inoffensive material, not unlike garden loam, from which the water is removed by filters or on sludge drying beds. The digested and dried sludge may offer a means of reducing the cost of plant operation if its commercial value is realized. The gas generated by sludge digestion can be used to heat the water which circulates in the sludge digester, and often to supplement fuel used in gas engines and incinerators. A chlorinator and contact chamber may be used to disinfect the remaining liquid before discharge to a stream. These processes constitute primary treatment. If complete treatment is required, two additional steps are added. Activated sludge aeration is one method of putting nature to work. Forcing bubbles of air through the flow provides the necessary oxygen for billions of activated bacteria in the sludge returned from the secondary settling tank. These helpful bacteria serve to digest and clump together finely divided polluting matter still in suspension or solution. From the secondary settling tank, the excess sludge not required for the activated sludge aeration process is returned for digestion and disposal as in primary treatment. Pennsylvania has well over 300 sewage treatment plants now in operation. New construction includes this plant in Philadelphia part of a $60 million program designed to serve almost one-third of the population of the state. Pittsburgh and 100 neighboring communities are completing plans for an even more extensive project. Many other treatment plants, large and small, are in the planning stage. Borough councils, faced with the construction of sewage treatment plants, find there are several ways of financing the projects. One popular method calls for the establishing of an authority to provide sewage disposal service as a public utility and authorizes the collection of a small monthly charge for this service. Pennsylvania factories are required to treat industrial waste to the same extent as cities and towns along the same stream. Adequate treatment for some types of industrial waste has proved difficult and costly, but in many other instances, waste treatment along with changes in processing and good housekeeping has resulted in savings of raw material, heat, and water. In some cases, reclaimed wastes have been converted into useful byproducts. Industry has already made great progress. Vast sums of money have been invested in industrial waste treatment plants. As research and development skills once applied only to raw materials and manufacturing operations are turned to the problem of waste treatment, more efficient and profitable methods are being discovered and put to use. The erosion of valuable soil from our farms, once a widespread source of pollution, is being brought under control thanks to the Soil Conservation Program of the Department of Agriculture. 
Even in these vast strip mining wastelands, the Sanitary Water Board has achieved a measure of progress. Strip mining exposes layers of sulfur-bearing rock and coal. The reaction of water and air with these minerals results in acid mine drainage, a dangerous source of water pollution. Sanitary Water Board regulations provide for segregating the acid-forming substances and diverting drainage water during mining operations. Today, the law requires that worked out strip mines be backfilled, graded, and replanted to check pollution from acid mine drainage. Meanwhile, under the direction of the Department of Mines, the openings of abandoned deep mines are steadily being located and sealed. Our anthracite industry, which mines and markets the world's cleanest coal, was in the past a major source of water pollution. Clean coal means dirty water, and this silt-laden water used to flow directly into our waterways, filling riverbeds and channels with millions of tons of coal and rock dust. So much of it, in fact, that it became a big and profitable business to dredge the coal from river channels for sale in competition with coal direct from the mines. Many of our once beautiful rivers were choked to death with silt. They said the water was too thick to drink and too thin to plow. Floodwaters, forced from silt-filled channels, covered valuable farmlands with a smothering blanket of coal and silt. But today, in cooperation with the Sanitary Water Board, anthracite coal operators are cleaning not only the coal they sell, but the water they use. Equipment especially designed to remove silt from the wash water makes the water clean enough to use again. From these impounding lagoons, fine sizes of coal are being recovered and sold as fuel. The lagoons are constructed so that coal particles settle out, leaving the overflow water practically clear. Water that's finished with one job, now reclaimed, clean and fresh again for other folks to use, adding new life to mountain streams. And there's new life for the Schoolkill River, too. Dredging the Schoolkill to remove the accumulated pollution of more than a century of neglect, a project of Pennsylvania's Department of Forests and Waters, and ultimately of the federal government, is the biggest stream dredging operation of its kind in the world. Today, in spite of the increasing volume of water pollution from Pennsylvania's continuous growth in population and industry, our anti-pollution campaign has already proved that this threat can be licked. Clean water means new life for our industries too, jobs for thousands of workers, and new industries attracted by the prospect of an ever-increasing supply of clean water as sources of pollution diminish. Although much has been accomplished in our anti-pollution campaign, much remains to be done. As our campaign progresses, there will be new life in our streams. Our streams and rivers must continue to serve by carrying treated waste away from our industries, our villages and towns. When this waste is properly treated, the waters remain pure and clean and can be used again and again for agriculture, for industry, for our cities and towns, and for us, the citizens of Pennsylvania. And so, at last, the problem of pollution is being faced and slowly solved by government, by industry, and by the citizens of our Commonwealth. Keeping our waters free from pollution and conserving our underground water supply is of direct and immediate concern to us all. For ultimate success, the campaign must have the full and continued support of the people of this great state, a people aware of and willing to pay the cost of vital anti-pollution measures. Only then can we fully realize our goal, to bring to all of us, at home, at work, at play, once again pure and clean, the waters of the Commonwealth.